Having talked a little bit about what sexuality is and what it consists of, I want us now to tackle a related question. Where does it come from? In our last lecture, we learned that historically, there have been two basic ways of defining sexuality. Some connect this to ideas about nature and others connect it to ideas about culture. This dichotomy between nature-based and culture-based arguments is also evident in conversations around sexuality's origins. Some people say that this is something we're born with and that exists independent of culture. Others argue that sexuality is something imparted to us by society. They say that sexuality is culture dependent. The first of these positions is known as essentialism, and the second is called constructionism. Essentialists and constructionists have long debated the question of nature versus nurture. Which perspective is more valid? Is sexuality something innate and inborn, or is it something we acquire as a result of living in specific social and cultural environments? Does sexuality come from our hormones and our genes, or are our libidinal energies shaped by social processes of learning? These are some of the things we're going to debate over the next couple days. The implications of these opposing viewpoints are quite profound. If we think that sexuality is an autonomous natural force, something that exists apart from society, then we're necessarily led to the conclusion that human sexuality is a kind of historical constant, that is, that it is unchanged from one era to the next. For the essentialists, sexuality does not really have much of a history. While one might be able to research the history of attitudes toward sexuality, or the history of efforts to direct sexuality toward one end or another, essentialists would say that this is really as far as one could go. That is, learning about things external to sexuality that try to regulate it. Essentialists would concede that on the surface, these efforts sometimes succeed. But nevertheless, they would argue that these efforts only impact people's sexual behaviors, not their feelings or desires or fantasies. These things, including our orientations, are hardwired into us from birth, and being predetermined, they cannot be changed. Thus, essentialists would say things like, homosexuals are born, not made. By contrast, if we accept the constructionist view, we're saying that sexuality is not fixed at birth, that it is not part of our genetic endowment. The logical extension of this is that we only become sexual in human societies. The content of sexuality, constructionists argue, is ultimately provided by human social relations, by human activities, and by human consciousness. Thus, sexuality, in terms of our desires, our identities, our behaviors, and our orientations, changes and can change with regard to time and place. That's the key distinction between essentialists and constructionists. Essentialists say that society only influences us in terms of our outward appearances, our actions, our choices, our behaviors around others. Constructionists go further. They say that society influences our internal states. They say that the kinds of people we're sexually attracted to, the kinds of things we sexually fantasize about, and our sexual orientations, preferences, tastes, etc. are all shaped by society. And on the basis of this, they would argue that the history of sexuality can be about more than people's attitudes towards sexuality or about attempts to regulate this. For them, the history of sexuality can also be about how our inner states change, about how desires and erotic subjectivities vary with regard to time and place. The debate between essentialists and constructionists has raged on for decades, 
and it is unlikely to come to an end anytime soon. But at this stage of the game, it does seem like the essentialists are winning. One way we can see this is in survey data. Within the US, for example, since 1977, the Gallup poll has been asking people about sexual orientation, specifically whether they think being gay or a lesbian is something a person is born with or something that is due to factors like upbringing and environment. The latest survey from 2018 shows that only 30% of Americans take the constructionist position. The popularity of that position has been in fact declining steadily over the last 30 years, and at the same time, more and more respondents have been moving into the essentialist camp. One thing this shift might reflect is the success of the gay rights movement, which has historically seen the born this way argument as a way to promote greater rights and freedoms for sexual minorities. After all, if sexuality is something people are born with, then gay people can hardly be blamed for being attracted to a person of the same sex. The essentialist position treats sexuality much like sex or race. Just like we have no control over what genitalia we're born with or what the color of our skin is, we also have no control over the people we're sexually attracted to. And of course, if discrimination on the basis of sex or race is unjust, so too is discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Essentialism also finds lots of support in the natural sciences, among biologists, geneticists, neuroscientists, and the like. Research on the science of sexual orientation really picked up in the 1990s, a decade marked by the Western scientific community's search for the gay gene. The attempt to find a genetic basis for homosexuality began in 1991, when psychologist J. Michael Bailey and psychiatrist Richard Pillard published a sibling study focusing on identical and fraternal twin brothers. The research showed, interestingly, that the likelihood of both brothers being homosexual is much higher if they're identical twins than if they are fraternal twins. Since identical twins share 100% of their genes, Bailey and Pillard surmised that sexual orientation is at least partially genetic. Now, here I must interject and say that there were some problems with this study. I don't have time to get into them right here, but if you want to know more, please ask about this during discussion. For right now, it's sufficient to say that criticisms made of Bailey and Pillard's work did not prevent their broader, broader project from going forward, and it was next taken up by Dean Hamer, an American geneticist. In 1993, Hamer published the results of a pedigree study conducted among 110 families of male homosexual volunteers. After compiling genealogical charts of these volunteers' families, Hamer found that higher than average rates of homosexuality among the maternal uncles and cousins of the gay men that he studied. Since these uncles and cousins were raised in different households than his research subjects, Hamer speculated that the cause of maternal and paternal relatives' differential rates of homosexuality was genetic, not environmental. To test this hypothesis, he had his volunteers donate blood samples. DNA analysis focused on the X chromosome, as that's the one males receive from their mothers. Looking at 22 different X-linked genetic markers, Hamer and his team found that those along the gene XQ28 were quite similar among homosexual brothers and their homosexual relatives. 33 out of 40 brothers shared the same set of genetic markers at XQ28. Based on this, Hamer claimed that sexual orientation was genetic. This study has also been criticized, and on numerous fronts. Again, this is something we can talk about in discussion, so feel free to ask questions about it.
In our remaining time, I'd like to talk a little bit about the constructionist position. The first inklings of a constructionist argument about sexuality emerged in the late 1960s. Following up on these, in 1973, the sociologists Gannon and Simon published a book called Sexual Conduct. The central argument of this is, as the authors put it, that sexuality is not a universal phenomenon, which is the same in all historical times and cultural spaces. Gannon and Simon argued that sexuality was created by culture, as culture defines certain things as sexual and others as not. That is to say, nothing is inherently sexual. As evidence of this, the researchers put forward the idea of sexual scripts. The term script here is a reference to scripts that actors read and memorize before performing a play or being filmed in a movie. Just like actors use scripts to guide their performance on a stage, so too do everyday people rely on social scripts, scripts that structure our interactions with other people by telling us what's appropriate and what we should say and do in specific situations. Scripts dictate what we should be doing at particular times and places, and they also help us make meaning out of the events of our lives. Some scripts are sexual, and they tell us how sexual experiences are supposed to proceed and how we should interpret them. Sexual scripting theory argues that the private world of desire, we so often believe to originate deeply within ourselves, actually originates from pre-existing social forms and meanings that we use to create ourselves. We might think that our sexual desires and behaviors are spontaneous, but advocates of sexual script theory say that's not the case. Another important member of the constructionist camp was Michel Foucault. A French philosopher, in 1976, Foucault published a path-breaking book called The History of Sexuality. Making the case that sexual desires are socially produced, Foucault's history dealt largely with the history of quote-unquote deviant sexualities, especially homosexuality. In narrating this history, Foucault argued that in the 19th century, for the first time, the homosexual became, in his words, a personage and a species. By this, he did not mean that nobody living before the 1800s engaged in same-sex practices. Of course they did. Homoerotic behaviors have been documented as far back as civilization goes. But, as Foucault had it, up until the 1800s, these were thought of as things that were immoral behaviors that anyone could partake in. It was called sodomy, and it was viewed no differently than theft, murder, lying, or any other kind of sinful act. They were the province of no particular kind of individual. But in the 1800s, as doctors started to devote more and more attention to people's sex lives, they lifted this subject out of the domain of religion and relocated it in that of medicine. And with this, sodomy gradually came to be regarded more and more as a condition, as a disease that afflicted only certain kinds of people. According to the sexologists, the homosexual was a separate kind of person, someone with perverse sexual inclinations that their biology had implanted deep within their beings. The homosexual, to use Foucault's language, was now a species, a particular kind of human with specific personality traits and an abnormal anatomical makeup. And as this idea of the homosexual became more widely adopted, a variety of other new sexual species proliferated as well, including the heterosexual. With the passage of time, as these new sexual categories gained acceptance, people began to understand their desires in the manner these models prescribed. Thus, according to Foucault, both heterosexuality and homosexuality are social constructs. All right, we're going to have to leave it there for now. Hopefully by this point you have a decent understanding of essentialism and constructionism when it comes to sexuality. Moving forward, 
I have some questions I'd like you to think about and respond to in our next discussion.